Uh, again, I, um, things that, that what's been on my heart, I, I, a few weeks ago, all the, uh, the church leadership worship team, everybody met at my house, and uh, I told them that day what had been on my heart, and I've not been able to get, to get rid of it. So I want to share that with you today. Um, and that is, over the past six, seven months, I have listened to so many people that profess to be prophets, that profess to know what God is saying to them. And, and they've made all kinds of claims in regards to the election. They've made all kinds of claims in regards to America. They've made all kinds of claims in regards to the coronavirus. And the list goes on. And, and <laughs> there are some who, instead of just admitting that they missed it, that they missed the mark, that they didn't hear what God had to say, continue in this vein and continue to... I, well, y'all know where I'm going with this. So, so some of these prophets, now they, they, they say the coronavirus is simply an attack of the enemy. How many's heard that? Come on, I don't know there's been more than that. Now, I want everybody to follow me in this because if you hold that attitude, I'm just going to tell you, you have a deist attitude. Do you know what a deist is? A deist is someone that says there is a God, but he doesn't keep involved in human affairs. That was Thomas Jefferson. He was a deist. Okay? Okay. My Bible tells me that God is interested in everything that goes on. That he's involved in everything that takes place. Now, is that true or not? So I can't hold that attitude when people say that because if something occurs on the earth, either God commanded it or he allowed it to occur. Amen. Everybody with me? So... That being said, that doesn't mean that good things don't happen to bad people, and it doesn't mean that bad things don't happen to good people. Because it rains on the just and the unjust alike. You know, my wife was probably one of the most righteous women I've ever known. But sometimes when judgment sweeps the land, good people get caught up in those things. I'll give you an example. When Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and all them other boys were taken into Babylon, was the judgment, the judgment wasn't on Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but they got caught up in that judgment that was taking place in the nation. Because why? Because leaders had decided to go their own way and walk away from God. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So sometimes, I don't care how righteous you are, you can still get caught up in judgment. I want everybody to follow what I'm saying this morning. So we live in a fallen world, and that's just a fact. And for some reason, God's people have forgotten that. They, they have gotten into this mindset that, that if, I, if I say I'm following Jesus, then nothing bad should happen to me. That, that if, if I'm following with Jesus, then I should have all this money. That I should just be able to do what I want, when I want, where I want, and how I want. That's not the way that it works in the kingdom of God, folks. And it's high time that the church start to get some sober-mindedness about it. Because they walk around like drunk men. Many prophets have said that America will be saved and come into a great revival. I, I, I'm hearing this more and more and more. Well, I'm just, I, I pray that's the case. I, I truly pray that's the case. But I will say that the, America is not the center of God's universe. <coughs> He allowed this nation to be lifted up for a purpose. 
And when this nation stops serving his purpose, it will be brought down like every other nation that it has ever been. He raises up kings and he brings kings down. Now that's what we're told in scripture. And if he's going to raise up a nation and then allow the nation to come down, well then righteous people are going to be affected in that. Everybody understand what I'm saying? <coughs> so why am I making such a big deal about this? <coughs> Excuse me. getting dry the reason I make such a big deal about it is is because we have to ask ourselves something we have people these prophets now I, I just read something oh, it's probably been a few weeks ago I, I read where now people are saying well we can't you can't criticize these people for telling all these predictions and then getting it wrong. Because by doing so, you're really judging God. I mean, how ludicrous can we be? So now when something is said that is wrong, it can't be called out. Now, I agree that we shouldn't call out the individual, but you certainly ought to call out the prophecy. Everybody follow me? Because I'm going to call out the sin and not the sinner. So, <laughs> they make the case that, you know, if we, if we do that, then we're criticizing God, we're judging God, and that's just not right. And, and by the way, that causes people not to believe in God. Well, I'm going to suggest that it causes people not to believe in God when you prophesy falsely. When, when you stay on TV or on YouTube or something of that nature and you make declarations that don't happen, and it wasn't just one, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't just one prophet. I, I, I listened to a host of prophets say the same thing, and they echoed each other's words over and over and over, and which all of case was not true. And everybody knows that a lot of us in, in regards to the election. But a lot of us in regards to the coronavirus. Folks, I, I just say this with all sincerity. God, when God brings judgment, he allows plagues to come across the lands. And where did this, where did this plague come from? Is it from the east? From China? Amen? I, I know that's politically incorrect today, but that, that's where it came from, right? Where did the plagues of old come from when they would sweep across the land of Israel? They came out of the east, and they swept into the land. Listen to me. This nation is being judged because we have walked away from God. I have said this for the last several years, that if we didn't turn around, that this was what was going to take place. And nobody would listen to me. Everybody said, oh, you're a gloom and doom. I'm sorry. I'm just telling you what I see in the scriptures and what I see taking place in our nation. And what's worse, what I see taking place in the body of Christ. So we need to ask ourselves some things because I want to clear up some of this nonsense because that's exactly what it is, is nonsense. Firstly, we need to ask ourselves, are we truly hearing from Jehovah, and are we feeding on his manna? Are we feeding on his manna? Or are we simply eating spiritual junk food? I, I, Sherry said something about uh, Mr. Bird's dog, that how it was overweight. And when you get overweight, you know what happens? You get lazy. I mean, you just do. It's natural occurrence. So junk food is not good for you, and too much of it will destroy your body. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So some of us like to snack when we're eating, watch a TV, you know, we get them snacks going, and, and hey, we're all guilty of it, right? But that's what I'm going to like in these, these prophets, too, is spiritual junk food. 
because while it may taste good when you're eating it, it has no nutritional value to it whatsoever. And when you eat that junk food, it dulls your senses. Anybody ever eat junk food and then all of a sudden you're tired? You want to go to sleep? Well, can I suggest that that's exactly what these prophets have done? They have fed you spiritual junk food to the point where you partake, and when you partake, you want to go to sleep. Why? Because you think everything's fine. And they have lulled the church to sleep. So what are we eating? Are we truly eating from the Word of God, or are we eating junk? 1 Corinthians 14, 32 and 33, it says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, why the reason that, that the spirits of the prophets is subject to the prophets is to keep this nonsense from happening is so that prophets can actually judge the prophecy that's given. See, true prophets are supposed to deliver God's word the way it's given to them, not the way they want it to be. See, we can see example after example of people who falsely prophesy throughout Scripture. I mean, it's not just in one spot. It's all over the place. And Jehovah even calls out those false prophecies. He calls out the false prophets. He calls out the false pastors and teachers. So this nonsense of not calling out bad prophecy is not scriptural. It's just not. But we've been lulled to sleep in the body of Christ. And lo and behold, well, if you say anything about anybody anymore, my God, everybody gets offended. Why do you think our nation is in such disarray? I mean, we can't even call out a congressman for being not doing their job. I mean, how would that work on your job if you can't ever call out someone that never does their job? So all morale starts to drop and the company starts to fall apart over time. Everybody fall because this person will go, well, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. I don't have to do what I have to do. And eventually it starts to filter into everything. Well, that's exactly what's taking place here in this nation. I mean, we won't call out congressmen. We won't call out senators. We won't call out pastors. I mean, we have pastors that stand in the pulpit that are sexual predators, and we won't call them out. We, we have people that stand here that are, <clears throat> okay, not what they're supposed to be. And we won't call it out. In the body of Christ, there's a debate about what is actually the Word of God and what's not the Word of God. But we won't call that out either. So instead, what people do is they just run from church to church to church till they find something that they really agree with, and that's where they'll sit down. And that's the very place that God doesn't want you. You better be going somewhere that absolutely challenges you to be better than you are today. So if if not calling out if not calling out false prophecy was wrong, then was Elijah wrong for calling out the prophets of Baal? I'm just asking a question. I, I mean, in First Kings eighteen seven, uh, seventeen and, and and eighteen, he says it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that uh, that Ahab said unto him, "Art thou the he that troubles Israel?" In other words, Ahab didn't like Elijah. And it troubled all these other people that Elijah would stand up and speak the word of God, and they didn't like it. It rubbed them the wrong way. And, and Elijah answered and said, I've not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, in that you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you followed Balaam. Well, I'm going to say the same thing today. It's not me that troubles the house of God. It's your own actions that troubles the house of God in that they have walked away from the commandments of God and went their own direction.
See, we need to realize that the word Baalim is the word Baal, Baal. And, and it really means what you have made your Lord. Something that's lording over you. And, and not only does it mean that, it means an adversary. So you have something that's an adversary that's lording over you. It also means someone, uh, not only that, it also means someone that babbles. A babbler. So a babbler is defined as someone that t uh, talks rapidly and continuously in a foolish, excited, and incomprehensible way. Boy, I know a bunch of those. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 6. You don't have to turn there, please. Uh, it says, forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. Forsake foolishness. Well, we got a, we got a world full of foolishness going on. The babbler is also defined as an obnoxious, foolish, and loquacious talker. The word ba Baal is related to the word Babel, which means confusion by mixing. So at the heart of all of this is confusion. Well, God is not the author of confusion. So how do people get confused? They begin to mix opinions. You hear a little there, and you hear a little over here, and you hear this, and you hear that. And all of a sudden, you, you start to blend this stuff, and you become confused. Now things don't make quite as much sense as they did before, and, and this one will start to lead you this way, and this one's going this way, and, and now all of a sudden, you don't know which way to go. I mean, has anybody ever went to this church, and they say one thing, you go over to this other church, and they say something else? Don't you think it's a problem? <laughs> I mean, we have one word of God, Right? But, but we have 50,000 denominations that split up and teach this word differently. That's an issue. <coughs> so, Jehovah isn't interested, you know, he's not interested in opinions. Your opinion, my opinion, it doesn't change what he's going to do. So we, have the, as the church, have been sold a bill of goods by some folks that, that while they may be great people, as you would see it, but, and they may do many wonderful things. I, I mean, they may feed the poor, they, they may clothe them, clothe them, they may do all the wonderful works. But listen to me, there will be those that stand before the Messiah and say, have we not done this? And have we not done that? And he'll say, depart from me. I do not know you. Now I'm paraphrasing. But somewhere along the line, with or without knowing, these people have walked away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Second Peter, if you want to turn there, Real quick, and I'm going to go back to, to Kings in a minute, in 1 Kings. But in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, Peter says this. He said, but there, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth, listen to what he says, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So Peter's warning about the false prophets and the false teachers, and he plainly tells us because of what they teach, because of the things they teach, that's what he's saying, because of the way they teach, the way of truth will evil be spoken of. So do you notice today that, that people can try to 
tell a truth <laughs> and everybody starts to beat up on the person telling the truth? Why? Because it's seen as evil. Can I suggest the same thing has been happening in the church for a long time? When people start to speak truth, other people don't want, they, no, oh, that ain't the truth. Why? Because we learned something different. Well, there's a difference between indoctrination and truth. I mean, have, do you ever remember a time in your lifetime when truth has been so repulsed by people? So Peter said that they would use God's people as merchandise. And that's exactly what these prophets do. They sell you a product called prophecy. Oh, they got plenty of DVDs and CDs and uh, books, and you just, you just go right down the list. And they sell you this. And people just eat it up because they love to eat junk food. And the best thing about their product is they get to make the rules. Well, yeah, I said that, but I didn't really mean that. And Come on. When you miss it, you dismiss it. I mean, I've stood before this congregation before and said, I was wrong. I'm not ashamed to do that because I'm a human being and I can make mistakes. I am not ashamed to be what I am. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you God said this if he didn't say that to me. But these kind of men and women, folks, are hirelings. They don't care two hoots about you. They don't care nothing about you. All they care about is money and popularity. And one drives the other. Popularity drives the money. So the more popular I become, the more money I can make. And it looks wonderful in the, in, in the look, it, when the parking lot's overflowing and people drive by and they go, oh, well, I bet that church is, I bet we need to stop and check that church out. But when you drive by a church and one maybe got a few cars in it, people going, oh. Their services must must not be very good. I won't say what I was thinking, but everybody follow me? See, because that's the way we're driven. But you need to reverse that. The ones that maybe don't have but a few cars are the ones you need to be sitting in the parking lot and going in the door. So people can easily get off course, especially when they don't really know God's word. And unfortunately, unfortunately, most of God's people don't know God's word. So it's easy to manipulate and confuse people. And I'm not saying they do it intentionally. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. As I said, with or without knowing, they have gone a direction and they have walked away from God, whether they knew it or not. And it's happened over and over in Scripture. Back in first, back to First Kings chapter eighteen. I, I'm verse twenty-one and twenty-two, and, and most of you all know this passage. Uh, but it says Elijah came to all the people and said, "How long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow Him." And if Baal be God, follow him. And the people answered him, not a, or answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, re only remain a prophet of, of the Lord. But by all his prophet are 450 men. Now, I mean, here's this one guy standing here against 450 prophets. And Elijah says, I'm, I'm the only one left. I mean, we know that because he goes to the Lord later and he says, I'm the only one left. And God says, no, Elijah, you're not the only one left. I got 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to the bell. But what's that tell you? How many did bow their knee? How many prophets had bowed their knee? to that? Listen to me, it's a system, and I'm getting ready to show you it's a system. 7,000. So Elijah says, make up your mind who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve this or are you going to serve God? I mean, 
That's where the church needs to be. Make up your mind what you're going to serve. You're going to serve Jehovah or you're going to serve the world? Because I'm telling you, I, I said this, you know, I said this before we ever, uh, before my wife got sick. Things are coming down the pike that we need to be ready for, and you need to know where you stand. So what are the two opinions? I mean, he says, follow God or follow Baal. So what, what's the way of Baal? Can I suggest to you it's the church of Jeroboam? Got to go back to 1 Kings chapter 12, and what you find is Rehoboam and Jeroboam, they have this little fight, and Jeroboam is worried that, that the, the people of Israel are going to want to back, go back to Jerusalem to worship and to follow the ways of God. So he's got a problem on his hands. So what does he do? He sets up a statue at Bethel and won it down. And he says, now these are you guys that brought you out of the land of Egypt. As I was talking about Friday night, the one commandment, the very first commandment, you know, we messed it up in the church. We, we have it as thou shalt not have any other gods before me. But if you go back and read, what you need to find out is that it is the very first commandment is that I am the Lord that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Well, if you understand that, Everything else falls into place because you can put him in his proper place. He's the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. You have to worship him, not something else. So they have this, this little thing, and, and <laughs> the Jeroboam says, well, we set up these statues, and now I'm going I'm to appoint priests, and I'm going to set up worship days, and we're going to have church the way we want to have church, and y'all can do what you want. What does that sound familiar? So you have two ways here. You either follow God's way or you follow the other way. Well, that just snowballed from Jeroboam's church. It snowballed throughout time. And I'm actually going to teach on this in Bible study a little bit. So he established... He's the one that established this new way of doing things in the land. So I have to ask this question, and I'll ask it again. Was Elijah wrong for telling the people of God to make up their minds? Now understand that Elijah wasn't going to the world and saying, make up your mind. He was talking to the people of God. Everybody on board with me. I mean, he wasn't standing there shouting to the world. He was talking to the church. Amen. Make up your mind who you're going to serve. See, Elijah wasn't prophesying to the people the other things that the other prophets were telling them, so they didn't like it. They had set up prophets that tickled their ears and told them what they wanted to hear. And some of you may be thinking, well, they were following other gods. That's Balaam, other gods. Well, what have you made Lord over you? See, while that may be the case, there may be uh, some of those folks that were bowing down before idols. I don't deny that. But I'm going to suggest to you, I'm going to suggest strongly that they were people of God that feared God. Let me prove it in the scripture. 2 Kings, go to 2 Kings chapter 17. These were people that actually thought they were walking with God. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 32. It says, so they feared the Lord and made unto themselves the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sanctified for them in the house, or sacrificed, I'm sorry, for them in the houses of the high places. So understand that he had set up these high places where they could go worship. So these priests that were made of uh, from the lowest of them, what's he talking about? God has appointed one way for a priest to be. Supposed to have been after the, uh, the lineage of Aaron and the Kohanim. Only those. So they come along and said, well, no, we'll, we'll, we'll make our own priests. So 
What's that telling you? Well, they're already outside the will of God. Is that not right? They didn't have the right to do that, right? They didn't have a right to set up a different place of worship, did they? They didn't have a so they come in and so they said, well, you know what? We're gonna we're we're gonna worship on the days we want to worship. We're gonna worship on, you know what? We won't even fool with Shabbat. We'll we'll do the next day. Our, we won't even fool with the feast. We'll we'll set up our own feast days. And so I can worship how I want, when I want, where I want, and God has to accept it. That's what this system was doing. But understand, what's it say right there in 1732? So they feared the Lord, but we're going to do it our way. So they decide who's going to stand in the pulpits and preach. <laughs> So we have boards and committees that do that. Instead of allowing God to send the people that he wants in the pulpits, we decide who is the most charismatic and maybe the youngest and whatever. Even though we don't care what God says, oh, we prayed about it. Really. They truly believe they fear God. Let me prove it. Go on verse 33. Look what it says. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom carried them away from this. Unto this day they do after the former manners. They fear not the Lord. Neither do they after his statutes or after the ordinances or after the law and the commandments which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob whom he named Israel. Your name is Israel. Your name is Israel. I don't care what people want to tell you. Your name is Israel. You are grafted into the vine. Your name is Israel. Plain and simple. So the people of Jehovah are going about their daily lives thinking they truly believed. They believed in their heart that they feared and revered the Lord. This is exactly what Elijah was talking about when he asked the people, how long will you go back and forth between these two opinions? You say you fear God, but you're doing this. So how long will the church as an assembly go back and forth between two opinions? I can't answer that for you. or from, I can only answer it for myself. I stopped a long time ago. But there's things that I need to work on myself. So if you're tired of being confused and looking for answers, then try eating from the manna and stop eating the junk food. Try listening to true prophets of God. and Stop eating all the junk that's out there. Start digging into the Word of God. Stop searching for answers on the Internet and all these other means. Because while you may find them, you're also going to find about 50 other or 50,000 other answers to the same question. And it's only going to leave you confused about what you've read. Stop going back and forth between man and God. God's right, man's wrong, end of the story. What was sin in the past, still sin today. Whether you like that or not. God didn't say you had to like it. He just said that's the way it is. I know when my mom and dad used to tear my backside up, I didn't like it, but that's the way it was. What God spoke in the past, ladies and gentlemen, is still applicable to your life today. Not just one thing, all things. For man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's scripture. So which words do you want to pick and choose? Because as I was talking about Friday night, 
The church likes to divide up the law into a, to moral law, civil law, Levitical law. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, there isn't one passage of Scripture in your Bible that divides the law. Now, it is divided into who it applies to, but it is not divided for you to say, well, uh, I, don't, you know, I don't have to do that. Listen to me. Who, who are you to go out here on the street today and say, well, I'm not going to follow that law. You know, that store there, I, stealing's not wrong. I'm not going to follow that. I can just go in there and get what I want. How long do you think you're going to last doing that? You know you're going to get arrested or shot. You understand what I'm saying? We, we do that to God, but we wouldn't, if you're a decent person, you wouldn't dare do that in society. But that's what we do to the Lord. We, we say, well, I won't, do, I won't choose this. I'll choose this. Oh. So we, uh, I'm going to start to close with this. So how do you know if it's a true prophet? How do you know if, if it's a true prophet? In other words, we have, to, we have to allow their words to tell us. If their words don't align with Deuteronomy chapter 13, run. Don't just walk. Run away from it. Deuteronomy chapter 13, I'm going to, I'm going to close from, from here. It says, it says, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder come to pass, whereof he spoke unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods. In other words, let's follow the way of the Baalim. Let's do what we want, when we want, where we want, and how we want. Which you have not known, and let us serve God them. Thou shalt not hearken to the words of the prophet or the dreamer of dreams. Listen to what the scripture is telling you. For the Lord, your God, proves you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So understand that these false prophets exist because God allows it, because he sends them among you to see whether or not you are going to listen to a bunch of garbage or are you going to ingest that, and if you are, are you going to follow after them? That's what it's there for, to weed out the wheat and the tares. <laughs> Just because someone says something and it comes to pass, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't make them a true prophet of God. See, that's, that's where people get all messed up. Somebody can come up to you and tell you something and it can come to pass tomorrow. But what do they follow? Do they say, well, we don't have to follow the ways of God. We don't have to follow the commandments of God. If that comes out of their mouth or if that is professed in their statement of beliefs, run. Don't walk, run. Because it's the way of the Baalim. It's the way of the Baalim. I'm sorry if I offend somebody in this, but this has been on my heart too much for me to ignore it. Don't walk away, run away. Because the time is before us. Our, our nation is hurting. The church is bleeding. And if we don't stand up and say, I'm following God, and that's the only thing that I'm going to follow, then we're going to be in trouble. Because if you remember correctly, all the false prophets were slain by Elijah. Hmm. See, we have to examine the fruit. You'll know them by their fruits. That's what the Messiah said. You'll know them by their fruits. So what is the fruit that comes forth from their mouth? Does it cause you to steer clear of God's commandments? If it does, then by definition, they are not true prophets. 
because they cannot cause you to walk away from the commandments. God just told you that. I'm going to read this and close. In, in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 30 and 31, it says, an, appeal, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. So, wait a minute. Oops. Did God make a mistake? Was he wrong to call out the prophets? I don't think so. He says, the priests rule by their own authority. And my people love it this way. But what will they do in the end? That's the question. What will we do in the end? If we continue this way, if the church continues this way, what will it do in the end? Now, I'm not talking about this congregation. I'm talking about the church as a whole, as a whole people of God. What will we do in the end? What do you do when you don't know what to believe? My answer to you is to turn back to God. Repent and turn back. Leave other opinions behind and repent. When you're confused about something, say, just start to pray and say, Father, I am confused. Allow this confusion to pass and show me. Show me in your word. Because I know there's an answer if you'll show me. Because if you don't, then we have to ask the question, if we aren't really tr truly following God, then where will we be in the end? If the righteous scarcely be saved, listen to the words, scarcely, where will the unjust and the sinners find themselves? That's why I pray this message touches somebody's heart, whether it be on the radio, whether it be on YouTube, whether it's here. I, I pray this, this message has been on me so strong. I pray that the nonsense among God's people will stop. That we will come together and start to worship together. Start to learn and glean from one another instead of fighting and backbiting one another. Because that's where it needs to be. How beautiful it is when God's people come together in unity. Isn't that what scripture says? How, how wonderful it is. It's like the, the, the anointing oil that flows off of Aaron's beard and runs down. That's the way it needs to be. It needs to be back to the way it once was. Uh, let me pray. Father, I, I just pray that I have delivered this in a way that, that you wanted me to. I, I, I ask for my words to fall to the ground. May your words go forth. Father, I just ask that you would just place it in our hearts and our minds to, to stop this nonsense of, of following after two opinions. But let us be diligently to dig into the word and to follow after you. Whatever it is, Father, whatever it is in me that you want to um, want me to shed, that you want me to place on that altar, allow it to be burned up, Father. Uh, uh, allow more of you and less of me. Because Father, I I'm, don't want to play games anymore. I, I know the time for games is over. It's time for us to become serious because this battle is becoming very serious. And while I know it looks like the darkness is, is, is ahead, the light is about to shine. And, and I know that you are you are the victor in everything that we do. And I know we'll have the victory as long as we press into you. So, Father, show us how to take the battlefield. Show us how to put on the entire armor that we've been given. Show us how to walk in righteousness, how, how to do all of these things that you've asked us to do. Father, show us how to do that. Show us how to get away from man and really be encompassed in you. And we will give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Father, I, I thank you. I, I have to thank you for my beautiful wife. I thank you for... 
all the years that I got to share with her. And Father, I just, I thank you that you love me that much that you would allow me to have her in my life. She's helped to guide my life and she's been my helpmate the entire time. And I thank you for that. And I ask you, Father, to give us all peace and understanding in our hearts that sometimes bad things happen to good people. And you didn't promise us a rose garden. And even if you did, there's always thorns on the rose bush. So sometimes we have to endure a little to see the beauty in things. Allow us to see the beauty in everything that you do. That we can always praise your name, no matter what. It's in Yeshua's name that we pray. Amen.